at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Today is Sunday, February 7th, 2021. And that means it's the first Sunday in February, which also means that it is Super Dwarf Sunday. So I'm joined today by Tal Seti, our Super Dwarf Reticulated Python from Reach Out Reptiles. Today's video is gonna be all about the experience that we had together getting TC's microchip implant accomplished. So you're gonna to get to see an abridged version of the microchipping procedure as in the steps leading up to giving him the microchip and then him getting the microchip and us scanning to make sure the microchip was working. If you're interested in seeing the long uncut raw footage of that, it's about 30 minutes long and I think that I will make it available on our Patreon. However, for YouTube, it's just too long and I think most people will lose interest because obviously whenever you do a voluntary procedure, like a microchip implant or an injection or a blood draw with an animal, you have to take your time and you have to be patient. And in order to make the whole process voluntary, that means that he had to voluntarily shift out of his enclosure. He had to voluntarily shift into a transport tub or a portable station, which he did. Then we had to move that to the area where we were gonna do the microchip implant. And then he had to shift from his station to the table where we were conducting the microchip implant. And then he had to target into an exact position so we were able to do the chip implant. We had to desensitize him beforehand to make sure he was going to be all right with touching. We had to clean the area with alcohol and then we did the implant. So it took a while, but we did all of that with TC's consent. None of it was forced. The whole procedure was 100% voluntary. He could have left the area at any time of his choosing and he didn't. So we're really happy about that and I hope that you enjoy the shortened version of that procedure. At this point, TC had already voluntarily come out of his enclosure. That's actually no big deal for him. We don't even have to ask him to do that. He was awake and he was at his enclosure door already wanting out, so we just opened the door and he came out and he roamed around the room a little bit and I wheeled this activity stand into this room so that he could climb onto it and then we could roll it over adjacent to the table where we wanted to do the microchip implant and so that worked out great because tc's used to this activity station and we wheeled it into the room and he eventually found his way over to it and so what i'm doing now is i'm asking him to shift from the activity station onto the table where we want to do the microchip implant now that tub that he's shifting out onto is our protected slash semi-protected contact that we're eventually gonna want him to position part of his body through to be some form of protection for the person doing the microchip implant in case when he feels the needle going in, he whips around to strike the implanter. This case, it will shield the person doing the implant from that strike. We don't expect TC to do that, but this is just a precaution. So we made this up for semi-protected contact. All I'm asking him to do is just shift out onto the table. I put this mat down thinking that he would like to climb on it because it would help him grip. However, he seemed to be avoiding it, so I ultimately remove it. But he followed the target down onto the table and he touched the target and I delivered reinforcement. Now this is step two where Jim is now asking TC to shift partially through the protected contact and then he's supposed to be asking him to hold on that target, but Jim didn't realize that the target should be below the level of the table, so TC's a little bit confused. At the same time, I was touching TC and cleaning the area where we're gonna do the implant with alcohol. This is step three. I am checking to make sure that TC does not already have a microchip implant. We had no reason to believe that he did, but this is standard procedure anytime you're chipping an animal. You always wanna scan the animal first and make sure that they do not already have an implant. 
Now, Jim is the handler and he's targeting TC through the semi-protected contact. He's supposed to be asking him to hold on the target disc. I touch TC with my hands. I touch TC with the syringe with the plastic cap on. Now I'm gonna touch him for the first time with the needle. And when he feels the needle for the very first time ever, he turns around and he comes back out the hole towards me. So that's where I know that we have to start and work on that approximation. So now this is stage four and TC is through the protected contact. He was not paying attention to Jim at all. He was focusing on me. And so I had gone up there to station TC exactly where I needed him to be. And in order to keep him there, I told Jim to go ahead and deliver the reinforcement. So TC has his food, I'm touching him in the lower third of his body, which he is completely used to. I'm allowing him to anchor around my hand while he eats. That's something he normally does. He finds whatever is closest and he anchors the lower third of his body around it while he eats his food. And so while he's doing that, I go ahead and do the microchip implant. I'm watching TC's body language very closely. I don't see any change in the behavior that I'm witnessing in the front part of his body and he's coiled around my hand just like he normally does when he eats. So it didn't seem to bother him that I implanted the chip while he was eating and it, it worked very well in this particular case, although it's not the order that I ideally would have liked to have done it in. Then I scanned him to make sure that the chip indeed did get implanted and it did. The chip number showed up on the reader and now I just wait there with him and allow him to finish eating. In order to get to the point where we were able to do the microchip implantation procedure that you just saw, we had to build Tau Seti up to the point where he was ready to allow that to be done. We did that by making sure that we had several foundation behaviors already in place. Tau Seti has been with us a year and a half and during that time, we taught him to voluntarily shift in and out of his enclosure into a portable tub, onto a scale, or onto a station. He learned how to target, which means that he's proficient at a targeting behavior and following the target from one location to another. We also made sure that he could do duration hold behaviors while allowing himself to be touched. That means that he could place his head on a target and hold it there until he was released. And at the same time, while he's holding in place, we were able to touch him. So he already knew how to voluntarily shift. He was already proficient at targeting and he'd already been taught long duration hold behaviors. The ideal sequence for the procedure that you saw was to have the snake shift out of his primary habitat into a holding tub or onto a station to then move that holding tub or station to the procedure room and then have the snake shift from the tub or station onto the exam table or the procedure location and then target the snake into the needed position which in this case was partially through semi-protected contact in a rectilinear position and have him hold his head on the target the next thing that we had to do was have the snake perform the duration hold while the procedure was being accomplished and then once the procedure was accomplished, we ideally would want to deliver the reinforcement to the snake. What we ended up doing with Tau Ceti is the alternate, although less desired sequence that you can do for this and similar behaviors. Steps one through four are the same, but step five is to go ahead and deliver the reinforcement as the procedure is being performed. And this way, the snake or other animal is eating, distracted, or otherwise occupied while you're doing the procedure. Now, this is acceptable, but it's not ideal. And the reason it's not ideal is because it risks surprising the animal, breaking their trust, because they didn't know what you were about to do, and now you've taken them by surprise to do a procedure while they were getting their reward slash reinforcement, which in this case was food. So what can happen if you did this over and over, which with TC were not, it was a one-time thing, but the animal could develop an unpleasant association with whatever reinforcement you're using if you continue to do an aversive procedure while they're being reinforced. 
So in this case, the reinforcement was food. And if we were going to continually be injecting tau SETI, so let's say that he was sick and he needed routine injections, like every day or every three days, and we were using this procedure, he might start to see the food as aversive because he was getting fed while he was getting the injection. So while it's not ideal, we used it with TC because it was a one-time thing and TC has been with us a year and a half and he's very habituated to handling while he's eating. He's very habituated to us touching him while he's eating. And because we had a little issue with him focusing on Jim as the handler, I asked Jim to go ahead and deliver the reinforcement. And then once TC was occupied eating that, I went ahead and did the microchip implant and it worked out fine for this particular snake in this particular situation. The lessons that we learned from this are that in addition to having these foundation behaviors in place and all of the approximations in place leading up to that final goal of the microchip implant, we need to make sure that we've tested the animal out in the room or on the location where the procedure is going to be done before we actually do the procedure because TC had a little bit of apprehension about the mat I put down. I thought I was helping him by giving him a grippy surface, but because he wasn't used to that, he actually avoided it. So in the future, when we do this with other snakes, we're just gonna have to make sure and take the snake into the actual procedure room, onto the actual procedure table and make sure that they're very used to it before we do the actual procedure. And then, we don't want to use a different trainer or handler during the procedure than the snake is normally used to. And that brings us to our last lesson learned, which is to consider getting the animal used to responding to more than one handler or trainer. What we ran into is Tau said he was only used to me training him and handling him. And when I handed that task over to Jim so that I could do the injection, in this case, the microchip implant, TC did not want to pay attention to Jim and he was still trying to focus on me because I was who he was used to. Everyone, we really want to thank you for watching and I hope that you realize what an outstanding accomplishment that was for TC to allow that microchip implant to be done and to do that completely voluntarily. As I said, he could have left at any time during that whole procedure and gone about his business in the room, gone back to his station, gone back to his enclosure, and he didn't. So to celebrate, TC and I bought ourselves a couple of these really cool, one-of-a-kind handmade tumblers from Reach Out Reptiles. Now, I say one-of-a-kind because I think each one is slightly different. They're not produced in mass so that each one is not identical to the other. And they also have mugs but I chose these tumblers because I'm not a coffee drinker and I am a tea drinker, but we have so many mugs that I just don't need more mugs. But I found these tumblers really, really cute. And I think that I'll be able to use them for more things than I would a mug. Um, they fit in my hand really, really comfortably. I really like the way they look. I'm really happy with them. And so TC and I wanted to show these off. And TC and I want to show off one more thing that we have here from Reach Out Reptiles, but we have to go in another room to do it. TC and I also just had to show you this fantastic poster that we got from Reach Out Reptiles that shows all seven localities, at least the seven localities that they put on the poster and that I'm aware of, of super dwarf reticulated pythons. It has the Salaire, Jampea, Kaiwati, Tombalongan, the Madu, Kalatoa, which is what TC mostly is, and the Karampa. So we are really happy to have this poster because it reminds us what all seven localities are and it tells us about how big they get. So we like it, my husband likes it, we're happy to have it as an educational tool here at Behavior Education. Until next time, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals. If you're interested in the posters, the mugs, and of course the tumblers too from Reach Out Reptiles, you just need to go to reachoutreptiles.com and they have all of those available on their website. And I want to thank you very much for joining us this week for another episode of Super Dwarf Sunday, and we hope to see you in March. And I don't know what we have in store for that episode, but I hope that you all join us.